start recording. Great, great stuff. Right, so tonight uh, we're talking about women. Uh, how can we help women be the best of what, who they can be? And one of the things that um, I hope I was going to be able to do tonight was to do a proper introduction about Black and Scott. But the only thing Francis had agreed that I will do tonight is introduce myself because you said you have been doing so much over the last few years. Take, take a step back tonight. It's especially because it's a women's night. And he said he's going to drive this, this session. So I'm just going to be looking, observing, and of course, as usual, helping behind the background. So I'm not leaving anyone uh, out, uh, you know, in limbo. I'm right here, but I'm going to hand over to Francis now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to me. I can't, I can't thank you enough for the things that um, you've been doing from when I met you, when I was still at uni till to, to this day. I, I've, watched, I've watched you grow to this point that just seeing you do your thing is quite inspiring. And, and I just want to say thank you. And, and also to the team. Again, I'll be your host today. I'm, I'm Frances. Most of you have met me. I'm just this crazy boy, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but very passionate, I would say, um, to see change and to see change in a larger scale. And, and, and what Black and Score, let me just give you a brief intro. Black and Score, as I said, is a women-led organization driven from a digital perspective to diversity to inclusion to equality within our community to see a diverse nation is our goal and to hold people responsible where they should be held responsible is what we envisage for ourselves and our organization and with our partners and everything coming together trying to make scotland and at large the united kingdom um, a better place and a more diverse place and this is part of our ethos this is what we live for this is what we breathe and, and to that, we, we put out the session to have this amazing trailblazing women coming here to talk and share their, their story as, as panelists within here. And without further ado, I'll just kick off by letting them introduce their, their, their self. And this is a conversation again. This is a conversation. We're going to talk about the things that probably affect us collectively and how the stories can motivate and activate the vessel in us and the catalyst that we would become. Um, I'll, I'll start from, from my screen. I'll start um, with Jane and uh, Janet, sorry, and uh, Janet to introduce herself, then we'll move to the, to the next. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Janet Londell. Um, I work uh, for BlackRock. I'm a VP at BlackRock. I've had uh, 12 and a half years uh, with the firm, uh, but 15 years in uh, financial services. Um, I was born in Democratic Republic of Congo, so I'm always more than willing to attend um, and be a panel to these type of events, not only to represent, um, you know, black professional women, but also to represent a very small community, um, UK community of Congolese people. So I'm really pleased to be here and hopefully share a little bit of my, my journey and hopefully it will help someone here. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I know you're just, you're taking it down. You don't want to tell us everything, but <laughs> we'll get that out. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And we're definitely going to move to uh, Sharon to just give a brief introduction about herself. Hi there. Um, absolutely delighted to be here. Um, so um, first off, just to, to, just to say thank you. I, I feel really honored to be invited along to this today. Um, Timmy and I and Francis met not, not that long ago. And I have to say, uh, the two of you and Black and Scott has had a massive impression upon me. And uh, it's, it's, I feel honoured to be invited along. So thank you for that. Um, I am Irish, living in Edinburgh. Um, and um, I've been here 30 years now. And uh, I work at Sky. I've been with Sky for coming up for two years. So I'm the, the head of diversity and inclusion in technology. And it's a job I absolutely love doing. I'm, I'm really passionate about what we do. Um, and I'm really passionate about difference. Um, and I, and I have a massive curiosity about people and I have a massive curiosity about how we how we can all come together in different with different experiences, different backgrounds, different histories and 
create really special relationships and 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 learn and learn from one another. Um, I'm very very keen to 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 learn as much from Black and Scott, um, which is probably will be more than what I can contribute. I would say um, earlier this year as well, we, you mentioned about the UN. Um, I was absolutely honoured this year to um, to be um, selected as a UN delegate for the Commission of the Status of Women. And it was an eye-opening experience for me because so many of the sessions talked about, uh, funnily enough, the, the, this year, the theme of it was about technology and how technology can help the empowerment of girls and women around the world. And um, that was a, a, it's a real eye-opener of a conversation and, and topics for me around, especially around um, how it has helped, technology has helped women in African countries. Um, but yeah, anyway, I'll, I have a tendency to witter on. I will stop now. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, Sharon actually mentioned that because when we met, we talked about technology because we all we're coming from a digital um, world from our background and and this is part of the things that black and scott offer we offer trainings for um for for scrum for scrum masters for agile um, business analysis cyber security we do provide others um services pro bono i know something <laughs> something most of us would understand um pro bono and this is what we do and uh, thank you very much sharon and i'll definitely move to uh sandeep Thank you very much. Thanks, Francis. Um, Janet and Sharon, lovely to kind of share this space with you. Um, hi, everyone. Lovely to, to be here with you tonight. I'm Sandy. Um, I am BBC Scotland's Inclusion Lead, so working in the space of diversity and inclusion. Um, I've been at the BBC for about 15 years. I was a lawyer before that. Um, I was saying to Francis and Timmy earlier, a very typical Indian upbringing, had to be a lawyer and accountant. Went into law, we can get into that, the, the pressures of cultures. I'm sure all of us can, can relate to that. Um, went into law, um, thought it was going to be glamorous, ended up in the very unglamorous glamorous world of conveyancing so did sort of residential and commercial conveyancing and um, people is what what where my passion is I love people and the more different the better for me and um, so I kind of left law and um, with a lot of begging of my parents if I could leave law went into human resources so HR and um, for a bit because it had the word human in it and um, left there and came into the BBC on a diversity scheme so it was a diversity scheme 15 years ago aimed at BME people as we were called way back then black minority ethnic people and um, it was a production scheme didn't have a clue what production meant I thought it was going to be my uh, step into media law that's where my passion was but fell into and um, got one of the places and fell into um, investigative journalism. So that's where we were looking for work experience. And I went in and sort of stayed in that department for 10 years and learned to become an investigative journalist with the BBC in Scotland, making Scottish documentaries and panoramas. And then towards the tail end of that 10 years, I um, felt there was more I wanted to contribute to the BBC. I'm sure we'll get into that. And um, sort of feeling like there weren't as many people like me that I, I wish there was um, to represent our, our license fee pairs and felt I wanted to contribute and make the organisation better um, and then got into the space of diversity and inclusion about four to five years ago. So I currently work in Scotland but across the BBC sort of nations and, and pan BBC trying to help make it more representative across our workforce um, but also the culture you know you know there's no point having any diversity if we don't have a culture that really allows everyone to, to bring out their best self and embrace that. Um, and so if I guess my contribution here, it's when Francis said trailblazing women, I'm sure Sharon and Janet are, I was kind of wondering, I don't know if you'd describe me as that, but, but I guess my contribution is around two things, around the BBC, the importance of d &I at the BBC and, and how we, we are looking for, you know, we need difference, we, we cannot survive if we do not have difference represented in our organisation, it's what we're here to do to represent society, but also on a personal note, um, it just the sort of personal accountability I think that we have to take for our own um, trajectory and and sort of my biggest lesson I guess for everybody is to embrace all of your difference I did that far too late in life I wish I did it earlier I'm trying to get my daughters to do it at a young age um, but just claiming and embracing everything that makes you different because that is what every organization is looking for but I'm sure we'll get into that Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And already we can see the commonality and you looking for one, we can see it. We can see strong, passionate women that are making differences in their various endeavors. And, and for this, we do appreciate you guys and all you've been doing and still doing. And yeah, without further ado, we'll would proceed with the order of the day. Um, just to look at things from, from your perspective, from your different background, from your different perspective. Um, 
I, I, I would go with um, um, Sandeep because you just you, you just spoke, and I'll, I'll start with you with this one. And when did you actually felt that buzz and realize your sense of worth? Oh, my sense of worth. Um, it's it's ongoing if I'm being honest I think um when you work in this sort of space of diversity and inclusion it's a really difficult space to work because you think what have I achieved uh, so when I was working in uh, sort of documentary making it was quite tangible I'd go home and say oh I did this interview we we chased down that criminal we did this we did that um but in this space it's very difficult because it's not very tangible things and, and there's not those you know those achievements on a day-to-day -day basis but I think my own worth was really at the start of, I guess, this space of diversity and inclusion, when I would start speaking to people and just sort of talking about my journey and my story and, and what kind of speaks to me. And what I would get from them is the kind of lights, you would see the lights go off in their eyes and, and there'd be a spark and they would start relating to things that I would say. And I would leave somebody feeling a bit more confident in themselves. And that's kind of where I see my worth and, and really the sort of power of, of me in this role is that. That's what kind of I live for, is, is making people feel comfortable with who they are and embrace all of that. And so I guess the first the first couple of times that happened to me, where I would get an email back saying, thank you so much, because of you, I now feel more confident in who I am and, and with what I have and the skills I have. So I think it was really those first conversations when I would get some feedback around what I did for other people, um, which, which is a strange thing because you'd think it'd be projects I've achieved and, and I've done initiatives, but actually it's how I can make other people feel is where I see my worth and that's what I get for myself. That's the kind of, that's what tops me up um, is the effect that I ha I can have and the power that I can have to, to just make somebody feel a bit more empowered with who they are. Wow, wow. That's interesting though, because it's as if once you hit the next layer, something else open. It opens a new world to you and you reveal yourself like, okay, this has always been me, but I needed this, this experience, I needed this struggle to actually hit the next layer. Yeah, it's liberation, Francis. That's, I mean, that's there's amazing. Power in, there's huge power in liberation and that's kind of what drives me is kind of, it sounds really soppy, but liberating people in their own skin. Um, I think there's huge power in that. That's amazing. Like I can tell you, I'm I'm so sure um, everyone here could relate because the stories is quite relatable how we keep pushing. Thank you very much um, for this. And th the same um, with uh, Sharon, um, your insight to that, your sense of what, when did you discover this? When did you get that magic? Like, okay, this is me. This is where I want to be. This is when I want to talk to the UN. I want to go here. I want to start making those changes. It's a, um, I was wondering if I would get the same question and I still haven't 100% sure of what my answer would be on that one. Um, <laughs> I, I think for me personally, a, a kind of from an introspective point, it was when I actually let go of what I thought is my responsibility of being of value to others, uh, uh, what other people's, what other people's worth they placed on me as and other people's expectations of me and realizing actually I had to find it for myself. And I'd say that was probably a good, quite late in life when I, I came to that one. And again, to Sandeep's point, the sooner you figure this out, the, the easier the, 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 the pathway becomes. Um, and I get so much energy from shared spaces with people. Um, I, I, um, I talk a lot about leadership um, and leadership is something that I think everyone has the capacity to do. It's not about a title. It's not about a position in an organization. I think everybody has the capacity to be a leader. But the thing is you can only be a leader if you have followers, because what are you? You're not, how can you lead if, if you don't have people who choose to follow you? But leadership is in the space between the people and the followers. And it's the energy in that conversation and that coming together and that curiosity and that relationship. And I, I get so much energy from good conversations, like the ones I've had with, with yourself and Timmy. Uh, really concrete, valuable, heartfelt, vulnerable, honest conversations and, and where you can bring your authenticity. So um, 
yeah, I, th I think that's, I, I like to create spaces that, that people feel that they can come be their whole selves, contribute their whole selves. And I will match that 100% with my own authenticity, my own vulnerability. And um, yeah, and I, I will happily champion that and champion people um, till I'm blue in the face because we all have, we all have such a unique value to add. And I want to create spaces where everybody has that equitable chance to do so. Um, and, you know, we're talking about embracing equity as, as the theme for International Women's Day. Um, one of my kind of mottos in life is where you start should never determine where you finish. Um, so, yeah, wow. Wow. I hope um, hopefully that gives you a bit of an insight. Absolutely. Just talking about how before you could actually take this and you think about vulnerability, and, and, and from a leadership point of view, you need to be vulnerable to actually see your true self in terms of leadership. That's amazing. That's a key point. That's a takeaway point. Thank you very much for this. Uh, it's, it, it's amazing just to hear the stories. Uh, um, Janet, then I'm going to switch to you now uh, with the same question, though, but I need you to go in. I need you to tell me that, that thing, that thing, when you realize as a, as a, as a, as a beautiful young Black woman, when you realize when you had this, oh, this is it. This is my sense of what. You know, I, I was really reflecting on this, and um, I'm so glad that Sandy uh, touched on that. That it, it's definitely an ongoing uh, thing, and you definitely learn uh, at different sp uh, stages in life. Um, but whenever I reflect on where I am today and, you know, what kind of person I am and what I'm able to achieve today, I always have to look in the past to be able to understand um, the journey that I've had. Why do I feel a certain way? Why do I um, uh, address things in a particular way? And um, then when I had to think about my worth, um, it's, it really took me back early as early as a 10 year old uh, Janet. Um, so um, just to give you a little bit of context, um, I was obviously born in, in DRC and I was adopted um, adopted in the Western way, but those who are from Africa, you, you know that these things happen quite often where you can go and live with a, an aunt or an uncle, a family member overseas. And that was pretty much uh, what happened for me. And that was really to give me a, a, a bigger opportunity for education, etc. But having moved uh, and lived with my aunt, her relationship or her marriage was becoming to dissolve and her husband left her. And just seeing the struggle that she had to go through because she was a stay at home mom in, in for that generation, that was obviously the norm, right? Uh, you know, you would get married and it's the husband that would take care of everything. I don't even think she even knew like what was in the bank account and things like that. She was completely oblivious to all of that. And for me, that was the first time I remember thinking, I never want to be that woman. I never want to put myself in a position where, and I know we have loads of men allies here, but I never wanted to put myself in a position where I was that reliant or that dependent, whether it being a man or somebody else, whether it being financially, my career, my education. I, as a 10 year old girl, really wanted to do something different for myself. And even thinking that way, growing up, with that kind of generation wasn't the right way to think. It's not something that I could have spoken out, you know, loudly. But I think that's really where I felt that I, I was worth more than that. You know, I wanted to work hard. I wanted to educate myself. I wanted to get to a space where I can have a successful career. And that for me is where I really identified that I was worth a lot more than just the typical expectations of a, 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 a Black woman or a Black African woman wow wow now i'm speechless because even hearing the story i know i could say this for a fact i can relate i can actually relate to that story because for me from where i actually got that buzz was from my mom this beautiful black woman that always told me like be the best you can be nice to people and trust your process 
it, she never misses to tell me trust your process and that is when I realized oh I can actually do it because there's someone there that actually believes in me and and, and one day I came back I was like mom I'm gonna change the world she said go my son you're already changing the world and I've never stopped I've mm -hmm. never stopped and this is where it, it, it's all illuminates it, it from the greater scheme of things it all makes up to this world that we live in to make a difference thank you very much for for your contribution to this uh it's amazing to hear your stories in regards to that and and now move on to the next one and this one is quite a tricky one but uh, i think it's what we're here for <laughs> for the hard beats um so your right to success i know sometimes you meet those hurdles and everything that comes with success. How easy was this to get these opportunities and resources to move faster in life in terms of career? How easy was that? Was that, was that something you found like easy come or something you had to manifest, talk your way through and kick the door open as a strong woman? So how, how how's this journey for you from for and and this should be coming I'll I'll go, I'll go with Sharon first um this from a white woman's perspective how's this journey been for you um I was uh, funnily enough we had a conversation in Sky today we were talking about allyship in a in a session today in Sky and um so when quite a while ago when i started in technology um it wasn't today or yesterday um it it was a very challenging environment um it was a predominantly male environment and it also was quite a sexist environment at the time um i would say very little opportunity came my way i had to navigate there was a lot of i felt as though looking back there was a lot of navigation that had to be done you had to navigate to kind of like the sexism, you had to navigate the politics, you had to navigate um, in many different ways the, uh, the, the society around that time. Um, I, I, the older I get, the more I realize I have to go out and create my own opportunities. You, um, I've, I've not sat around and waited for them to come to me. Um, and also as well, but realizing that in being able to create those opportunities a lot of that comes with white privilege as well um and because i've had the opportunity to have an education i've had the opportunity um to grow grow up in an environment that um we, we weren't the most affluent but we had we did have um you know we, we did have the basics and that isn't something that's afforded to everybody and that so i i I also as well, I was very keen on, I looked around me and I could see where opportunity hadn't been taken, opportunity hadn't been missed and people didn't have an ambition to go out and get things. And I decided, no, that that wasn't going to be me. Um, and I wanted more um, than what was kind of laid out for a white Irish woman from the Midlands of Ireland who normally people don't go to university. So. Um, I decided that that wasn't going to be for me. Um, so, yeah, I'm more the kind of kicking down the doors. I might knock on the door first politely, and but then the, the, there will be some kicking done. Um, and I, I would encourage people to to really think about what it is they want and, and think about how you build out your influence to go out and get what you want. Um, and bring people with you on the journey. Abs absolutely. It, it, it comes to shows like it's never easy. It's never easy. The, the odds are never easy. And, and this is me. We're cognizant to the fact that I'm a black male, but there's still some privilege. I'm a male. That alone is still a privilege in today's world. Thank you for for your story. I know it's never easy being white or or black woman oh, no, or it's, someone of well, color. It's never easy for anyone. Um, uh, we understand that. It, it, but at the same time, as well, when we say it's never easy, as well, from my perspective, I 
I, I don't look at it and think, oh God, that's really hard. There are challenges. There are always challenges in life and the challenges can come in throw so many different ways uh, with regards to where you are at socially, where you're at emotionally, um, where your health is at, uh, in the, you know, educationally. And those challenges, um, those challenges will always present themselves and they'll crop up out of nowhere. It's, I think, having the mindset and the attitude to to want to navigate them and to want to kind of find your way through. Um, it's like there's an element of map reading, I think, that needs to, be, to go on. Um, we were talking about this, but if, if, figuring out your own map. <laughs> Actually, everyone needs to figure that on map. Hey, get a navigator. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate that and the insights um, that you just uh, gave to this. Um, I, I'll, I'll move to Sandeep for the, for the same same question. Just just tell us about your own beat in in terms of your right to assess uh, opportunities, resources. Was this forthcoming? Was yeah. there something you got like easily? Well, you know, again, so you're probably going to have similar themes, similarly to Sharon, that's something that's just happened later on in life for me, uh, that kind of knowledge and awareness that you have to create your own opportunities. So for me, as I said, studied law, it was expected of me, and um, fell into law, that was expected, it was the natural progression, you do your degree, you then do a, a, a traineeship, um, fell into a firm, it was my dad's lawyer that we got work experience with, so that was all very easy and mapped out and got in and that's where I did my traineeship. Um, didn't enjoy it as I said um, but carried on doing it fear of my dad kept me going for three and a half years um, not wanting to disappoint the parents so that kept me at this job that I just did not enjoy um, for three and a half years working as a solicitor and then as I said it took a lot of courage to leave law um, I'm sure people on this call will appreciate the 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 pride that parents have in their children and how they almost you know you are part of their status you know, they use children as a part of their status in the community, that my daughter's a lawyer, that was massive. Um, and I didn't want to disappoint, even though I hated it, and, and it was making me miserable every day. So it took a lot for me to beg permission at the age of 20 something, and um, beg my parents permission, can I leave law, please? Um, and to deal with that, you know, disappointment was really hard for someone who has always sort of lived to please the parents and, and that kind of standing in the community. It's been a huge part of my upbringing and a, and a real struggle that I still deal with today is the kind of a conflict of, of how I'm seen and, and my how I reflect on my family and, and parents and um, that whole thing of shame it's very powerful um, in the community um, and very damaging in the community so so anyway then I left um, I went into HR as I said but left that to come into the BBC. So the BBC is really where I guess I kind of want to talk about where I fell into journalism, stayed there 10 years. Again, that was just easy in the sense of that was my job. I did it and, um, you know, really honoured to help tell the story of some of the most vulnerable in society. And so, so that was a real privilege. But this increasing feeling of um, I don't feel I belong. You know, there weren't people like me in the newsroom. You know, media is very white. The legal industry was very white. Media industry, very white. Um, newsroom, particularly white male dominated um, with a real kind of unique culture, um, you know, full of people who were talking about being, you know, a print journalist. And that's not the background I came from. So feeling like a complete fraud for 10 years. I'm not good enough. I'm not as good as them. I'm not a proper journalist. Um, I still struggle to say I was a journalist because I've never felt like I was a proper journalist because I didn't fit that mould. Um, so yeah, I kind of really struggled with that, but then where things changed, where when it, just to Sharon's point, things just came at the right time for me in my life. I have two daughters and, um, you know, I've always suffered kind of anxiety and, and stress. I'm, I'm a high achiever in that I set very, very high unachievable expectations of myself based on the expectations of the community and, and family. So for me, I'm always a failure. I'm always failing these expectations that I set for myself and these standards. So I was going through a lot of things at the time. Um, I was putting my work before my children a lot, you know, just the, the nature of the work, investigative journalism, it's not nine to five. Criminals criminals don't work nine to five, unfortunately. So you move when they move. Um, and, and there was lots of times, and I remember one time I'd taken my daughter for swimming and um, I was answering messages from from the team that I was working with we were trying to track people down and she's standing shivering in front of me and my husband said what are you doing um and I said I just need to answer this message he's like no you don't I said I do I do it's really really important he's like no that's important she's important right in front of you and kind of that was a big kind of wake-up call for me that my priorities were all wrong 
So I started CBT, cognitive behavioural therapy, to try to um, reset my mind um, around my priorities and um, my children. And then a job came up at the same time um, for diversity and inclusion. It's where my passion started to, to you know, take me. And I just wanted to kind of be a better role model for my daughters. I've always grown up not embracing opportunities because I saw them as a challenge rather than an opportunity. I was scared of failure because I always had to be a success for my parents and, and the community. Failure was never an option. Therefore, I didn't want to try new things because I didn't want to fail. So it's easier just not to fail because then I'm always a success. Um, so I wanted to start embracing opportunities. And the only way to, to talk to my daughters about doing that was to role model it. So I sort of threw my hat in the ring for this big job at the BBC Nations and Regions Diversity, never expected an interview, but I, you know, took them along that journey with me, constantly saying, you know, I'm really nervous about this, I'm really scared, but I'm proud of myself, and just to show them the feelings that I was going through, um, but yeah, lo and behold, I was offered the job. So as soon as that happened, that was a real turning point for me, because I had never put myself in the space of opportunities before that, and then suddenly for me, oh, wait a minute, I've just embraced an opportunity and actually I've got the job so there's maybe something in this I should maybe try this again and then another job came up and I went for it and oh I got that job okay there's something in this and so so to, to Sharon's point I think what I've really learned again far too late in life I'm 46 now I wish I did it way before this um is actually embracing opportunities that's if there's one thing I can tell everybody is do not scare from them uh, run from them do not see them as challenges even if you don't get whatever the opportunity is there's so much learning in that process um, and that's what I'm trying to say to my daughters to embrace opportunities and you have to again we hear it all the time and you tend to ignore it you have to create your own opportunities and what I've learned is there are there's a way to, to you need people you need people to get to where you want to go always you will need people so you need to be strategic in who those people are. Pick your people, pick the good people and the right people and get them on side. Um, and that always found, you know, the word networking we discussed earlier this week, it was always a scary word. <laughs> you know, Timmy, we were saying that in our culture, I was told you don't go out. You don't go out because it's a big, bad world. You know, an Asian girl, stay home. Um, that's how I was brought up. Um, you know, you don't get out at night, especially lots of bad things happen at night. Um, you don't mix with people because there's lots of bad people and you could go down the wrong path. And, and all of that is just networking. That is literally what networking is, just talking to people, meeting people and intention, doing that intentionally. And so, yeah, so I think you have to create your opportunities. Things are not going to be handed to you on a plate. Very rarely does that happen. So you have to think now and, and now it's just it's just natural now. It's, it's it's part of what I love about this job. It's just meeting people intentionally, connecting with people, because you never know what amazing opportunities are going to come out of connections. You know, we met this week, uh, Francis and Timmy, and we already have plans to to hopefully collaborate going forward. And that's just you know, that's how these things work. And so what I would say to everybody is. Yes, you have your hopes and dreams, but you have to do something. You have to take a bit of ownership and responsibility for that um, and try to connect with people who are going to help you along that path because there are some amazingly good people out there who will do that. They will help you along that path. Um, so, yes, everybody has a right to opportunities, of course. Oh, my days. But you have to try to do your part in that. Absolutely. It's not going to land on your lap. Wow. Wow. And this one really hits home. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your story. Um, and, and, and we can see for everyone here from the, um, the young to the old, you can see it's never too late. Key point, it's never too late. To start, it's never too late. You can always start from where you are. And, and, and you can see from, from, from Sadiq's narrative, you can see the ups and the downs. But the only thing we seem to actually put the spotlight on is the win, is the glory days. But no one sees the downtown. No one sees the help that she seeks. No one sees the struggle. But we appreciate you. We, 
we thank you very much for sharing your story and, and bringing this to light. And can I'm I just so say, sure. sorry, Francis, just on that kind of, it's it's a work in progress. I'm a work yep. in progress. <laughs> so I'm still going through <laughs> counselling again, you know, again, just I'm at a different point in life, but there's other things that I'm wanting to change. And so there's this huge power in just looking at yourself in the mirror. I think it's an amazing starting point for all of us. Really, really getting to know yourself will help you in dealing with any other people out there. What I think, was it Janet, you said, I can't remember, but really get to know yourself. What makes you think the way you think? Where does it come from? It comes from somewhere always. Uh, I've only recently come to terms with lots of conflicts around my kind of Indian heritage and the culture and things that I've gone through in life. I, I've only recently come to terms with that and kind of put things to bed and really feel comfortable with who I am now. Um, and I know that's things that happen a lot in our communities because you're torn between very, very rich cultures and pressures from the communities. And that can really damage us. And I think sometimes the community as a whole needs to take a collective responsibility on pressures we are putting on our, you know, generation after generation after generation, because it has a lasting effect. Um, and I think mental health is another huge thing. I'm sure we could do a whole separate session on. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And and that's something we're looking uh, towards uh, on our forthcoming conference in October. We really, especially from our community, um, we've not even started talking about mental health. We've not even touched um, a bit about it because we're not taking it serious. We need to start relating that and find the correlation between mental health and growth. We mm -hmm. still need to fuse this together. Thank you very much for uh, for your insight. I, I do appreciate uh, the personal stories. I'm so sure we've all learned um, one or two from it. Again, the way you navigate, always remember, it's never too late. Um, um, I'm just going to move, because we're quite conscious of time, I'm going to move uh, to Janet to just um, give us your insight. Just give us your insight. Um, how's this journey been for you um, in terms of assessing, seeing these opportunities and making sure that you get those opportunities and use those resources available to you to cover a niche for yourself, to create a path for yourself? How have you maneuvered this? Terribly. <laughs> <laughs> to, to say I like the least. No, I like um, <laughs> The thing is, um, again, go, go, going going back, right? Um, I like um, for at least some women who have who have had a similar journey to mine to really have hope, right? Um, I didn't have the mom and dad. I grew up with, as I said, uh, aunties, and it was an extremely toxic situation that I was around, right? And um, not everyone, and especially within our communities, these things are always kept quiet. Even when people are aware that there's a young girl in that house who is being treated like a maid, essentially, no one speaks up on those situations, right? And again, going back to that 10-year-old Janet, where I was really determined, when I tell you, like, I grew up, you know, I was taking care of my auntie's children, my auntie's home, you know, by 11 p.m., midnight, I'm there studying for my GCSEs, right? So I... If I was to sit here and tell you my life story, I'm today 41, everything that I have gone through in life, somebody will ask me like, how are you still here, right? I have gone through uh, toxic abuse, um, all sorts of things, right? That you can take your imagination as far as you can, any negative things that a woman can go through, I can definitely tick those boxes. However, something in me has always had a light, right? I've always been hopeful. I've always wanted to be different than what was expected of me. You know, my aunt, for her, if I had failed in life, that would have been, you know, the ultimate result for her. And not realizing that the fact that she was so adamant of me failing, that was fueling my my hunger for success, right? So 
And it's not to say that, you know, anything that I did was easy. At every stage in life, as I mentioned, my GCSEs, I was going through abuse. My college years, I was going through abuse. University, I didn't finish, but there was also loads of things that I went through during that stage in life. Got my first job. And again, when it comes to jobs, I, I always say, I think my, my father blessed me. Those, those who know, know, right? When you get those blessings from your father, I think as far as I'm concerned, those have stayed with me. If I've ever gotten a no from a job, it was probably because I was underqualified and I can probably count in one hand how many no's I've received as far as jobs are concerned. But I've been able to definitely find ways to better my horizons, whether it being through, through work, through looking for those opportunities. However, having been at my firm now for 12 and a half years, I feel it's important for us as individuals to really be able to identify earlier on ways to to be very strategic about our career. And I feel that is definitely an element that I've always missed. And I feel that I'm doing a very good job at that. And I can say it's been like two to three years where I've, I've had to really become comfortable with strategizing. As a woman, that word strategy always, meant, always felt like it was me being unauthentic, that I was, planifying, you know, it, for me, it was a negative thing to strategize because I'm having to really be tactical and calculative about certain things. I got a mentor who really helped me realize that you can still be authentic and it's okay to be very calculative about your career because that is you taking your power and that is you writing that narrative about where you want to go and how you want to do it. I personally intentionally wanted a mentor that was everything that I am not, from race, from gender, because I wanted to be able to see whether applying the same things that they were giving me, if I, I will have the same result. And I'm telling you, as long as you're able to really set that path, strategize, really identify what are my strengths, where do I need development? What do I want to do? What do I feel I am great at that I'm not really achieving today? And that doesn't matter whether you're black, white, male, female, as long as you're really able to look at those things with a close eye and really identify those opportunities, you will have a successful career. Today, I can say things are easy for me only because I have been able to plant the seeds in order for something to grow. It's not because I feel like I have a, there's an opportunity there and I can just go and apply for it. No, I've literally been able to work in terms of my networks, my relationships, really identify that area where I feel that's where I want to go. That's how I am strategizing in terms of who am I meeting? Who am I speaking to? Before a meeting, like literally I put my intranet. So we have like an internal kind of Facebook of employees and I will have a look at who's on that meeting, right? And look at their reporting line, look at their bio and really be clear and see the opportunities of the conversations that I'm doing. And all of that is part of being strategic. As women, we really need to get comfortable with that and really get comfortable with changing the narrative of our career. It's so important. Where you come from, where you have been, allow that to be the fuel that drives you to that success, to that career. I say amen to that. <laughs> oh, my days. The key. I see a lot of contributions in the chat. Oh, sometimes. like the, 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 the Q&A is going, is buzzing right now because sometimes when we talk about strategy, we only relate this from the business aspect. So Janet kind of mentioned checking your strength and weakness. Literally, she's kind of SWOT analysis within herself. She's strategizing. She's talking about strategy, but for me, how am I? going to maneuver this how am i what's the best option for me considering the fact that there's hurdle that i can actually see for my race 
from my upbringing and in society as a whole, how do I maneuver these hurdles? It's a key one. Get comfortable. Absolutely. And if I can just add one, one last thing. Um, one thing that my father uh, also left me with was that I never felt that there was anything that I couldn't do. If, there were, if I had to play football with the boys, I will be there playing football. If I had to do whatever, he was very encouraging of that. So I've always walked into an interview, not looking at Janet, a woman, a black woman, but just looking at myself as who, what am I bringing to the firm? What qualities am I bringing to, to this position? What, what experiences am I bringing that will make me a good fit for that position? The only thing that I would change from that mentality that I had back then is that it doesn't matter how confident you are walking into a, a situation, but it's really important to be aware of the challenges that another black woman or another brown woman or another woman can go through just for applying for that role. I think Sharon mentioned before, you know, that there are certain roles that are very male dominant. I, I started in operations, literally working back office for trade, trade traders, and that's a male docu, uh, dominant uh, environment. And if you can assess that, okay, I'm walking into a male do dominant environment and this is the role that I'm applying for. Those are the type of things that you really have to be aware of as a woman, be aware of as a black woman that, yes, it's not easy. So how can I present myself in a way that will gain the trust of these people? You know, what, what um, I guess, research do you need to do? And especially in this time and age where there's so much access, whether it being LinkedIn, whether it being Facebook. When I tell you, I, I, I do my work. Today, I really do my work. You can pull someone's name on Google <laughs> and you can come up with something, right? So it's really important to be aware of the environment that you're walking in. Even if you've never struggled in that space before, you could be the person that makes a difference for somebody else, for a 10-year-old, 15-year-old, 18-year-old, 21-year-old Janet that can come into that same position and have a completely different experience because you opened the door for them. Absolutely. Oh, gosh. Thank you very much um, for saying this. There's something that I wanted to pitch out and you just stole my words. At, at, at the same time, we need to take responsibility for everything. Can I, can I also so, sorry yeah, Francis yes oh, go on Sharon uh, add to that <laughs> I've I was just going to build on what Dan was saying Janet I'm, I'm blown away I, I, I'm the the inner I can feel the energy literally coming out of my screen here it, it's amazing um you reminded me of of an analogy I, I like analogies um and uh when we think about how we move through and navigate through and, and find our our way through these things we, we can use the analogy of career like so for say for example in a in the career world we talk about the career ladder a ladder needs to be on steady ground to be able to yep. be stable yep. a ladder only one person can go up at a time and in on a ladder you can only help the person directly behind you and if a rung breaks the ladder stops functioning so what if we were to talk about the analogy of a cargo net? What if our careers were cargo nets? And a cargo net is based on people further up anchoring the net, okay? People navigating the way, well, okay, that way is blocked. I'll go this way and maybe I'll have to go this way. But also as well, the cargo net will land in any uncertain terrain and it'll just land. But, you know, if we keep the cargo net long enough, it will, it will, no matter how uncertain the terrain is and, uh, and uneven the terrain is, it will provide that first step up for everyone. And also as well, when you're on the cargo net, look behind you, look beside you, who can you help? Um, I love your energy, Janet. I love, sorry, I just wanted to build on that. If that analogy came to mind. I love your energy. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I'm so sure everyone's buzzing. I, I can see the, the question. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. I can't I can even express uh, my gratitude to all, all three of you. Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm trying to breathe because this reminds me of 
my, my sisters um, going through a university, engineers, uh, mathematicians, and all of a sudden, you can just see the drive worn away. And you can just see that. It's like, no, there's no way. Like, no one's giving us interview just because we're women. It's like, take responsibility, push. You have to own this. You have to use those, those failures and convert those failures to motivate you. And that's how you self-inspire yourself. Thank you very much, Janet. And thank you, Sharon and uh, Sandeep, for your, for your stories and insights. Um, I think we're going to take a few questions because there's so, there's so much going on right now. And I'm, I'm going to read out a few. And that's one that just uh, caught, caught up to me. And, and I think I'm loving this one. Um, so say, someone says, who's that? OK. Um, she said, hi, Sharon. You spoke about investigating um, politics. Are there healthy politics in the workplace, especially in a male-dominated sector? And how do you avoid being caught up in a bad politics in the workplace? A very good question. Politics gets does get bad press, yes. Um, there are good politics out there. And what is politics other than debating and discussing? Um, I think that where we can really, really make traction when we talk about diversity in the workplace, be it gender diversity, be it ethnicity, be it um, sexuality, or it doesn't matter your, whether your social mobility, any of that. Um, I think it all comes from discussion and debate. And it's about listening to people's other other people's opinions, listening to people's just their perspectives and their, their life experiences and being prepared to just to absorb it. And 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 I think in those discussions and in those debates and in those kind of in essence positive politics, that's where we can really learn. Yes, there, it, um, the, I think the further up you go to an organization, the worse the politics gets, because, um, you know, we, we talk about um, psychological safety in the workplace. I think the further up in an organization you go, the less psychological safety there can be, not necessarily all the time. But um, and, and with that can become come negative politics, I would say in all instances, I can only speak from my own experience, what I try to do is focus in on the people focus in on hearing others um and we're called humankind for a reason i think we've lost sight of the kind bit of it we need to really think about what it is to be, to be humankind um and showing that human kindness and by listening to others appreciating other perspectives and um just be and, and a little bit of an, an internal mantra of just because it's not my way, just because it's not my experience, doesn't make it the wrong way, doesn't make it the wrong experience. Um, Absolutely. Hopefully that answers the question. If if it, it, it doesn't it does. answer the question, the person can get back in touch, please, separately. That from my view, I think it kind of like bring things into perspective in that in that way. Um, it's never easy. <laughs> especially when quote unquote um it's it's stark politics um it, it's never it's never been fair <laughs> in that sense and you just again going back to what um um janet said you need to understand self yeah, you need I think to that's understand an important self. point that sharon made as well around um you know understanding where people come from and, and yeah. there's, no, there's no such thing as a as a yeah. there's no such oh toya and who's that in the background We've got a, we've got another member. Um, there's no such thing as a view from nowhere, right? We all have a view from somewhere, and I think that that is the key to to all of this. I think you have to want to meet people almost where they are. Mm -hmm. It's lovely. It would be lovely if we were all in the same space, but but that's not life. Um, and it certainly would be a bit less interesting, I guess. But I think there's so much value in trying to understand where somebody comes from. Very rarely, I think, you find people that are just bad for the sake of being bad. Uh, we are all a product of our upbringings and environments and experiences. And I think the more you can understand and appreciate and acknowledge that, the easier it is, not for them, but the easier it is for you. 
It's mm -hmm. a lot less stressful. It's a lot less draining emotionally and mentally when you come to accept that, that this person isn't saying all these things because they're being bad um, for no reason. They are a product of their upbringing and environment. And Absolutely. the more you can understand that, the easier life becomes for you, less, far less stressful um, and easier to navigate. If I can make a recommendation here, sorry, Francis, I keep interrupting you. Yeah, um, no, I would no. just, it's worth exploring the differences between responding and reacting. Um, uh, this comes from if you have an awareness of self and also want to have an awareness of others and, and an appreciation of others, that sometimes politics will come from when we react, not when we respond. And if we respond, if we take the time to step back, reflect, consider, and then respond, um, often we 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 will build safer spaces for for us all to, to contribute in. Hey, as a, as a good saying says, um, a wise man once says nothing at all. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll hold that. Um, um, thank you very much uh, for that question. I'm so sure um, um, that that's been understood by everyone. And I, I just have this this personal question and um, for for all of you. Um, Taking into cognizance, I'm a black man. I work in a sector that many women, black women, are more or less non-existence in that in that in that sense. How can I acknowledge my privileges as a black man? Also knowing that I faced like so many difficulties and hurdles, how can I use my own privilege to speak out? for women within my workplace as an individual? How do I go about this? How do I bring myself, how do I start this conversation? How do I amplify the plight of a woman, especially the black woman? Because statistic has shown us that the black women are definitely underrepresented, underpaid and undervalued. How do I use my voice? I need advice. You're doing it. I think you're doing it, Francis. I think uh, we've all said you have you just have to start doing it. And I think we all, you know, I hate the word privilege. I personally, I really do. I'm sure lots of people love it and some are indifferent. I, I don't like it personally, but I just think that we all have um, the ability to amplify and raise the visibility of others. And that's literally what we should do. And, and that's what being an ally is, regardless of what your background is and who you are and who you're trying to champion and, and sponsor and raise the visibility of. It's just what we should all be doing as human beings. We all need to create the, the talent pipelines that come after us. We should be doing mm -hmm. that in our day jobs. We should be doing that, you know, professionally and, and personally all the time. And I think it's just what you've you've said that you just start having those conversations. And I don't think we have to start saying oh I am aware of my privilege I am this that you know I just don't think that's necessary I don't think we need to go into all of that and I am aware I'm aware I have my end my identity is this 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 but what I don't have is this and that's what I'm trying to I think we can get too caught up in identities and it's, it's so complicated it really is and I think just by saying we are underrepresented in with x data is showing us that data is key um um, and we need more um, more you know representation across the board and and I know some amazingly talented women and they are xyz I just think we should all be doing that just naturally I think we have a tendency to overcomplicate things <laughs> I think we just need to literally raise the visibility of talented people talented women who are out there because they are out there and without people saying that and championing people then organizations are left on with the misunderstanding that we are lacking talent. I hear mm. that day in, day out. Where is the talent? Where are they? Who are they? So what I try to do on a day-to-day -day basis is say, well, here they are. Here they are. I've gone out and met some of these people. There's some amazing talented mm. people in this Black and Scott, you know, membership and an organization. I've met so many today, full of this many, you know, these talents, these strengths, these experiences. Here they are. How can we use transferable skills to get them into the organization and then introduce them to the people that are making the decisions? You know, I'm not a hiring manager. I would love to hire everybody. I can't. Um, but I have to then speak to the, the people who have the influence and are, are in decision making and introduce them to the talent that does exist that's a fact it does exist Absol absolutely absolutely thank you very much and and you mentioned something it, it, it's more like black people we should stop apologizing and we stop probably teaching everyone every other time <laughs> people need to study for themselves about these discrepancies that exist and you, you should stop being someone on the on the comment session said probably high time you just acknowledge and stop 
it's not an issue to have privileges. It's just using that privileges to combat the things that are odd to society. Uh, it's good. Um, does anyone have any intakes to that? Yeah, um, the, there's something that I, I even say to my Black professionals network here, that in order to have allies, we need to be good allies. We can't expect to just, you know, expect everyone to accept and acknowledge our existence without us also trying to out, having outreach as well, you know, whether it being joining some of the other networks or joining panel events also to better understand what others are also going through, I think is really important. And as Sandeep said, Francis, you're literally doing it. The fact mm -hmm. that you've allowed Timmy to take a, a back seat and, you know, you, you take the driving seat today, that's already, you know, you being a good ally. Um, another thing I would say is, and that, that honestly for me this year is what I am taking at every council meetings that I have, every committee network meeting that I have is that we need to be more intentional, right? So if you are in, you know, if you have opportunities to hire and you are aware that there is, you know, a lack of uh, female or a lack of black professionals or whatever demographic of people um, out there, I think it's important to really drive things with intent. Let's stop hiding behind, you know, D and I, we're trying to be inclusive, da, 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 da. That doesn't mean nothing if five years from now, you still only have a team where there's 20 men and one woman. So we really have to be a lot more intentional in how we are driving policies, how we have our DNI strategies, and really say, we need to hire Black. We need to hire five Black people. Whether it be, if you're, if you're with HR, for example, HR needs to have a bit more of intent of reviewing CVs because they're pretty much the gateway, right? The, the difference between, I guess, the UK and the Americas is that we don't know who is coming through the door unless they disclose themselves. So it's really important to partner with, with our HR partners, et cetera, and really ensure that they are they they are they have visibility of who they are, you know take the candidates that are coming in in terms of interviewing, et cetera, and really be a little bit more intentional. Mm -hmm. I remember even as far as um, at the, towards the end of last year, where HR literally called me up and said, everyone that you have on your you know, list of potential candidates, you're missing this, this, and that, and that's not covering you know, a specific demographic of individuals. So just something like that, it, it also causes me to reflect on my own personal biases because we all have it, right? So to have somebody else also point out, actually, Janet, I think you might want to maybe think about adding somebody else, adding another female, adding another male, or et cetera. It's really important. So please do take that away with your firm. If you're going to have a conversation with HR and just think along the side and along the lines of how can we be a little bit more intentional through our hiring or even our promotion boards right because having women in senior positions as well is another struggle you can have 10 million women in a firm but if only men are in senior positions that's also something to address so it's okay to hire women it's okay to hire black but let's make sure that we're giving equitable opportunities for everyone amen to that thank you thank you very much janet um uh, just to protest on um what you've said uh, i i remember reading a book um called um the bottom of the pyramid is about conscious capitalism um, in, in that sense but why i refer that book is because we need to be conscious of the decisions we make when we're in the place of making those decisions because we all stand as a vessel to this change that we want to see. So it, it, it got both ways. We can be the change and we can make the change. So it's up to all of us to start making that change, to start speaking truth to power, to start amplifying that. I think my, my, my role is like, 
we need females here. Like it's just so male dominated. I don't think it's okay. We all can see and changes would do definitely would occur just doing that alone. So the, the UNOS falls within all of us to start making those changes. I know I'm doing it. I'm, if you go to my bank, they, everyone knows me. I call it for what it is. And I'll continue to do that because that's who I am. And I just want to say thank you very much. And I just have, I'm quite conscious with time. And I just have this question um, just to say, looking back in retrospective, your younger self, and looking at today's world, what would be your advice to her? Um, um, Sandeep, do you want to go first on this, please? Oh, wow. Um, I think it's, it's that thing of um, embracing who I was at an early age. I think if I had done that at a really early age, um, I am sure that I would have tried to embrace other opportunities earlier on and not left it too late. Um, trying to kind of live for myself rather than for other people, which is what I've done for many, many, many years. Um, so yeah, I would say embracing who I am early on, but actually being comfortable with that because there comes a point where you recognize who you are and you acknowledge actually this is who I am. But then there's an added struggle of how that then conflicts with what is expected of you. So you sort of, there's this realization and that's all wonderful, but then you have to become comfortable with that in your surroundings and your setting and your family and your community, because it jars with some expectations. So there's an added struggle beyond that. So I think if I could um, start embracing who I am and then feeling comfortable with it, that that's what I would say to my younger self. Wow. Thank you very much. And I, I'm so sure she's listening. She's on this call um, because what your world's going to do is inspire the next generation. As I said earlier, we are all vessel and we don't even know where the next leader would emerge from, probably from Black and Scott, probably she's here listening. She's going to be the next leader that would propel this journey uh, to, to, to a greener pasture. And, and thank you for that. And, and, and I'll, uh, the same question, um, if I could move to Sharon to, to actually throw more light and what would you tell her, the young Sharon driven with ambition what would you tell her? Knowing the world for what it is, the malicious way and everything that comes with it, all the huddles and also all the lights that comes with it, what would you advise her? It's quite funny, isn't it? Just listening to, to Sandeep and to Janet and, and, and what these two inspiring ladies are, are also contributing to, but their younger selves. Um, I, would, I would tell myself, I am enough. Wow. Um, I, my growing up, um, unlike Janet, I, I didn't have that kind of constant reassurance. And, and the, you know, you, you talked about uh, what your father uh, was there to you. I, 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 it was a different relationship I had with, with my parents and, and I was never deemed enough. And so I created a sense of worth based on their notion of enoughness, which I never measured up to. So um, I would, and this, uh, this is a, being a little bit vulnerable here, and I'm just going to throw it out there, but I would tell myself, you asked the question, so I'll, I'll give you the honest answer. Um, I uh, telling myself, you are enough, you are more than enough. And, and just to, to, to allow myself to, to fully inhabit who that Sharon was when she was that 10 year old girl, the 12 year old girl, the, the very, very insecure 15 year old, um, and, um, yeah, I, I am whole and I am enough and, um, and I don't need anybody else's verification or validation for that. It, it's nice when you get it, but, um, but I, I can, I can live the whole me and live my whole life knowing that my contribution is, is, will always be my best. And that is enough. Wow. Wow. You're, you're, you're indeed enough because, <laughs> hey, posterity has shown it. <laughs> you're indeed enough and you're doing great things um, for the world at large. Uh, what you're doing with UN, what you're doing, uh, getting in touch with Black and Scott, like pushing us, giving us the right inside. Sharon, you're amazing. And hey. Okay, stop now because I'm starting to get emotional. <laughs> so you can stop. <laughs> hey, I'm just, I'm just saying it. I'm just calling for what Thank it you. is. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and Janet. Um, 
uh, again, just looking at this one, I'll be like, that 10 years old girl, just taking a reflect, uh, just reflect back and be like, oh, girl, it's your time now. What would you tell her? See, just listening to Sharon, I think you already got me started. <laughs> And I came prepared. I came prepared. <laughs> um, it, it's a it's a difficult one. Like I said, I had gone through a lot. Um, if anything, I would I would tell her I love you. Wow. Because not hearing those words being said to me from when. Um, my father was probably the last person to say that to me before I left um, back home until obviously I was old enough, um, you know, to, to find relationships. But um, today, looking back at some of the relationships I've had, the, that emptiness, that lack of love really caused me to make some terrible decisions. And, um, yeah, I think just her just knowing that her self love is more than enough, because today I think it oozes out of me like I, I could be without my hair and everything. I love myself in every single way. And I think it will be important for the 10 year old Janet to just know that. And it's not to take away from the path that I've had because I feel that it's made me who I am today. But man, if Janet knew that love then, I think she would have just been something else today. Um, so I think that's really important. Wow, wow. I just, I just can't. I can't phantom this because it feels like my whole life just reflecting back as a male too and going through my struggle I, I just need to tell myself boy you've always known you should have just kept faith <laughs> like for whatever reason when I was younger I was about 11 and someone asked me, like all my friends, like, I want to be a doctor. I want to be this. And someone asked, what do you want to be? I said, I want to invest in people. Like, I was so young. I was so young. And if you ask me today, the type of first, and ask me the same question, and I would say, I still want to invest in people. Because I've always been true to myself because my mom told me to be true to myself and I still keep that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I can't, I can't thank you guys enough. I, I'm so sure looking at the, the, the questions here, if we start going through all the questions, we're not, we're not going to end this, this session. But just, just, to, just to reiterate, we appreciate your stories, your insights, the fundamentals and this brings so many things into perspective from the angle of race from the angle of allyship collaboration knowing to self thank you for bringing all those components together just to let us know that we are enough to make the change thank you very much thank you very much uh, to our panelists i know if if this was like a live audience i know all the hands would be going but we can still put the claps on uh, we can still put the claps on. Thank you very much. And we do appreciate you. Um, thank you very much, Sandeep, uh, Janet, for your story. Sharon, for always being an ally to our community. You're always here. And just to say, we, we, we surpassed 100, 120 more people coming and living. And like, it's so engaging that nobody wants to go away. So this is the first time I'm seeing um, webinar like this, like, it's just so stagnant and says like people don't want to leave this keep coming thank you very much for for this this is all you this is all your voices uh, and, and thank you for for agreeing to 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 share your 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 word of wisdom and uh, to us and just to say um we've got the conference coming up the big conference in october and definitely would like to invite you guys to come share this this this, this stream of thoughts 
not just to this niche community, but to the wider community in Scotland, the whole of Scotland coming together in this event, this beautiful event to talk about different aspects from mental health to, to, to women and monopause, to talk about our lack of self, understanding self. We're bringing all this component together in Scotland. And we'd like to invite you guys. And we'll get to you officially, but we'll just train that out there. And so the world could see. <laughs> I'll tell you right in. I'm in. I'm, I am so in. Yeah. And, and in, that, in, in that thank you, I, ha I have to say, I, I don't think I, I've attended a lot of panels. I've sat on a lot of... Um, I have never, this has been by a country mile, the best thing I've ever been involved in. So thank you so much. And I feel Aww. so... <laughs> well, and I use the term, I feel really privileged to be here. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I've just, I've literally I've got goosebumps. So. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> this, this means a lot to me. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that. And thank you to everyone. At the point I just have to go off the camera, I was becoming so emotional. And taking from what Sharon has said about being vulnerable, Sometimes we may just need to understand that there are not there are not alone. There are so many women that look all put together, strong, powerful, but they still have their vulnerability. You are not alone. You are not. And I listen to Sandeep and I listen to Janet, and I'm like, everyone has come into my room and seen something about me from these powerful women. And I just thought maybe sometimes I'm alone and I can hear from across the table. I am not alone. I'm enough. I, I am, I am loved. You know, so I love myself, and I can't say thank you enough. I really, really want to say thank you. I, I wasn't expecting the turnout to be this much. I've been getting my phone has been buzzing. I, at some point, I had to tell people, please, this is very important to me. We will talk later. <laughs> and they were just want, wanted to ask questions. When can we have this again? Who can, can we bring them again? Can we? Uh, we will. <laughs> Yes, let's finish today. So I will talk to them. Thank you so much to Absolutely. everyone. Thank you. And guys, we only had two weeks to prepare these speakers. And this is to tell you, this is what their life is about. They are not reading off a script. There is nope. no script. It was, it's just their life they are bearing to us. And if they are there today, that means you can also wherever you are now in your career, in your business, in your personal life, you can also take that decision today that you're an enough, you have much love to give, and you can also go out there to be something to someone because that is what Black and Scott is about. We don't want to see you uh, saying that, oh, when, how, you can. That's all that you need to believe right now that you can. I just want to say thank you again and again and again to everyone for coming over, for all our to all our allies, especially the male. My husband has been giving me thumbs up here and like, <laughs> go, go, go. <laughs> I just want to say thank you. Thank you to everyone, to all the powerful women on board. They are here. I've seen all of them here now. I don't want to start mentioning them because they will say I have favorites and I do not have any favorites. You are all favorite, my favorites. You are all my powerful engines. Tony Black and Scott and the men as well. So thank you. Thank you to the speakers. Sharon, thank you so much. I know we've been throwing emails back and forth, but we are here now. So thank you so much. Sandeep, I can't say thank you enough. You know, when it comes to culture, sometimes you think you're alone. But when you start talking about the things about the things that have held you back and we started re really, you know, it's like we have a card and we're just really enough of them and we're just ticking, ticking, ticking is the same. And sometimes you just need someone to bounce back those thoughts Absolutely. and you know that you're not alone. So thank you. Janet, everybody now loves Janet. <laughs> They've been buzzing. Your LinkedIn. You Janet and your LinkedIn. And your LinkedIn. Sarah we need to post your LinkedIn because the we LinkedIn. Need to post. I'll be sharing everyone's LinkedIn to, to the yes. group. So uh, just stay tuned. I'll be doing that right Please now. Please connect with this power. Yeah, someone, from my, on LinkedIn. someone from the team uh, would put okay. that right away. Yes, yeah. we'll do that. Thank you so much. That's from me. I don't want to say too much, otherwise, I'll start getting very emotional again. So, and about our conference coming up in. October, we have a big conference coming together. We want to talk more about things like this. We will have a section for women if you want us to re repeat this. And yeah. that will be very personal. You can reach out. You can touch Sarah, Sharon, Sandy, <laughs> and Janet and know that they are real. <laughs> yeah. So please keep it in mind. We will send the data as soon as possible. It's going to be 
sometime end of October, but we are really excited about Black and Scott Conference. So thank you. I hand over back to Francis to say the final words, hopefully not the final words. <laughs> For now. Well, thank um, you. <laughs> hey, thanks. Thanks goes to, 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 to everyone that have attended um, this, this webinar. Uh, you guys are so special. Um, the women, you're enough. You're beautiful. You're amazing. The word is yours. And we as, an, as allies, we are rightfully behind you. We would continue to push. And sometimes follow your lead. All the time, be with you. And that's what we would do at all points. And for me, I would say thank you. And all right, let's go to the day. Still Bye, bad weather, but, <laughs> but thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. I, I really appreciate it. And Timmy. Um, I I'll add to you in Dubai, but thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Right, bye now. Bye. Bye, guys. Cheers. Thank you very much. I am posting all the links to of the speakers. If you want to click them now, you can click and join them right away. Thank you so much, everyone. You have been amazing. Thank you. Thank you. And we will see you very soon again. Timmy, I, I can't thank you enough for inviting me to do this. This has been an utter privilege. Uh, just, I'm beyond words. This has been oh, thank you. Just, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Sharon. Have a good I'll weekend. With you very soon. Have a yes, good please. One yes, definitely. <laughs> thank you. And Sandeep, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you everyone. very much. Thank you. This is amazing. Thank you very much, everyone. Black and Scott team, thank you, everyone. There's somebody, there's somebody on the call. Her name is Elisha Cooper. I'm calling her out. She used to be, we used to be in the same organization. She's somebody you want to hold down. Really? I'll give you oh, a contact. Yeah, she's doing oh, great. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank yeah, you, Elisha. That's Elisha. Welcome <laughs> on board, Elisha. Out. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Elisha. <laughs> We're going to link you up. We're going to link you up. We're going to do something together, Elisha. Thanks for coming. Right, thank, thank you very much. much. You thank you, Elisha. <laughs> thank All you. Right, Mika is one of the directors. Bye. So if you don't know her, the one, she's one of the directors of Black and Scott. <laughs> thank you, Elisha. We'll reach out. Thank you very much, everyone. I posted a link of all the speakers. If you want to connect with them, please do. They are always, always eager to talk about opportunities, about how you can lift up yourself. So please connect, connect, and connect. But don't forget networking is key. It is absolute key. Thank you. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Timmy. This is wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We need to talk. We need to organize something very soon, especially in Aberdeen. We need people to come to Aberdeen to us. Thank you. Thanks, Timmy. Thank you very much, Sirian. Thank you. People are still joining. We finished. I know. <laughs> Some people just joined. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, all. Thank you. Wow. You too. <laughs>